You're listening to the Sunny Brown Breakdown. Now it is time to break it down. Welcome to episode number five of the Sunny Brown Breakdown, a podcast where we discuss the training, teaching, health, and education of mixed martial arts. In this episode, I talk to Daniele Bellelli. He's a writer, martial artist, and a university professor. He is also the host of multiple podcasts, including the Drunken Taoist podcast and the History on Fire podcast. He has also authored many books such as On the Warrior's Path, Philosophy, Fighting, and Martial Arts Mythology, and Not Afraid on Fear, Heartbreak, Raising a Baby Girl, and Cage Fighting. Here we discuss how martial arts is the perfect medium for learning the limits of your capability and reaching your potential, despite a few broken arms and busted knees, and why the timid sport of soccer has the most violent fan base of them all, and why a jack of all trades may be the master of none, but can oftentimes be better than a master of only one. Now let's go to the podcast. Daniele, great to have you here. It's a it's a pleasure. I've been a fan of your work uh, for a, for a long time, especially uh, on the Warriors' path. So I just thought I'd get into just initially about like what attracted you to start training martial arts in back in the beginning. What was it that drew you to it? I think I I think it's what a lot of us had. Right, we watch too many Star Wars movie, we watch too many Bruce Lee movies, and there's that dream which all those things are built on. Like the mythology of it is, you know, young lost guy who goes to the wise master who show him the way of the Force, right? And mm-hmm. suddenly you are not the young lost guy anymore. Now you are a Jedi master, and then it's what we all like, right? Because what it is is uh, it's a dream of empowerment. It's uh, like the whole martial art movie story and martial arts in general is the story of you are weak you are uh, vulnerable and you don't want to be any of those things and there's a process to get there and so you really it has a lot of kind of the joseph campbell the hero's journey type of vibe right mm-hmm. where it's like you're gonna go on this quest that's going to transform who you are and is gonna reforge you into something that you like a whole lot better I think why we all do it, you know. Yeah, I think I've 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 had the same thing. I've often wondered, would I, you know, would I have experienced a broken arm in a in a mixed martial arts fight if it wasn't for the Ninja Turtles? Right, exactly. <laughs> probably not. And probably not. But you know, is that is that idea that then's drawn us to it? Is like, is that just you know a romanticized fictional idea that? you know western people have of of eastern martial arts that that is just made from media media companies i mean it isn't it isn't right it's like anything else like any time when people are like oh it's just romanticized i mean to some degree of course right that's where but it's also usually based on a seed of truth so you take something that's real i mean the way that martial arts do transform people the empowerment that is very real you do take the fact that some people in the martial arts world inevitably have been more than just the thugs and people who can throw a good punch, but have also had something interesting to say about life. And you just zero in on that part that's extra interesting and you make it the stereotype, right? That's how, you know, most stereotypes are not born out of like completely making stuff up out of thin air. You take mm-hmm. seed of truth and you just blow it up to where that's the image of the martial art teacher. Now, 95% of martial art teacher you're ever going to run into are not like that at all. Mm. But, you know, you zero in on the part that you like, that you dig, that you wish it to be. And then that's what the movies will focus on to the point where it looks like that's what it is in all occasions. And of course, it's not in all occasions, but that doesn't mean it's not that way in any occasion. Mm -hmm. So then to actually to actually get that experience out of it, you know, this transformational turning, you know, making the weak strong. It's a very it's a it's a noble idea that that draws Mm -hmm. us to it. But then, you know, we go into a martial arts school and generally, the you know the first thing we might encounter is a, you know a savage beating at the hands of of some person who's a lot bigger than us, right. sweating all over us. How how can that uh, you know how can we actually get that through through that kind of training? Well, and in fact, that's one of the sayings, right? That the toughest person in any martial art room is usually the the white belt who signed up the latest because. 
it's gonna suck for them, you know? Everybody in the room is better than they are. And to keep showing up day after day when they know that they are gonna get their ass kicked for at least a year or two before anything starts happening, that takes some serious mental strength. And in some way, that should be rewarded with, with shining the spotlight on it. But that builds some hell of a mental toughness to go in, day in and day out, day after day after day. All you're gonna experience is just loss and somebody squashing you. Mm. And you know, they can be nice about it and ideally you don't go to a psycho school where they are just overly brutal about it. But the reality is that even if you're playing nice, you're still gonna get your ass kicked. And so that part is where really the big, in some way that's the part that interests me the most about martial arts. Because you know, we all like, the we all like the perfect armbar the great spinning back kick you know the technical mastery is beautiful to watch and we all want but one of the real benefits is that toughness that you develop by going into uncomfortable situation by going into getting used to losing getting used to getting pummeled getting used to fighting on when it feels hopeless mm-hmm. that to me that can be used outside of martial arts a more than the perfect technique that realistically are probably never going to do it outside of the martial art room. You know, it's like, that's the stuff that will translate to life because inevitably life will deliver Godzilla size kicks to your groin and <laughs> you will have to deal with it and you will have to have that toughness to come through when things feel hopeless. Yeah, that's, that makes sense to me. But, you know, to get, to get that, that toughness through, through the martial arts training, you know, we could we not also get that through just other other forms of training that, that could possibly cause us, you know, less, less risk of uh, injury. We can push ourselves. Maybe someone could do, you know, triathlons and or what, whatever they choose. Why? What would make the martial arts special over any other any other pursuit? I think. I mean, what you're saying makes perfect sense, right? You can get there. You can get very similar lessons through many other paths that have nothing to do with martial arts. So I don't think that martial arts is the one and only. I think there are other ways to get some of those lessons. Mm-hmm. The one thing that's fairly special about martial arts is that it really is uh, it's about ritualized conflict. And it doesn't get any more primal than just unarmed conflict with another human being. In the most in the least intellectual and most objective way possible, just two physical bodies clashing with one another, and one will triumph and one will get bummed. Hmm. It's very primal, right? It's an archetype. It's something that, you know, you can learn lessons about conflict through playing basketball, through rock climbing, through whatever the hell you want, right? There are many, many paths to it. But they don't have quite that kind of archetypal quality that martial arts has. Because really nothing deals with conflict in such a direct and uh, raw way as martial art. Mm, yeah, I, I, I agree. There's, there's that, for sure, that primal element of human nature that, that draws us towards it. But, you know, if we're, if we're being drawn back to our, our primal nature into a, a, a less, you know, a less intelligent form of, of being, isn't that... You know, isn't that a, a, a de-evolution, a, a regression back? Should we not be trying to be, you know, the civilized, uh, the you know, live in the civilized manner and get away from, from all that conflict? Yes and no. In the sense that I feel that on one end, if that's all you are, and, you know, your entire world is built on just clubbing somebody's in the head and, you know, being physically dominant, and that's all you understand. You know, I can think of better ways to spend your time. And you know. at the same time, I feel that sometimes modern civilized life, which is awesome in a lot of ways. You know, I like going to sleep without the thought that an enemy tribe may come in the middle of the night to cut my throat. You know, stuff that yeah. I, I did that part of modern life. But at the yeah. same time, there's something that as long as we have both, as long as we have there are certain energies that are part of who we are both physical and psychological and i think is uh, martial arts in that sense are the perfect ritualized way to tackle those very primal energies mm. in a way that that's constructive and can work in modern life 
you know, nobody's telling you that in order to achieve those things, we need to organize uh, gladiator games where we just face off with blades and one will survive. That's taking it a little too far and in a not so healthy direction. Mm -hmm. Martial arts are kind of like that perfect medium. They give you a taste of this energy, allow you to explore it, allow you to learn that edge, allow you to learn that part about yourself and about life without being something that takes you to a completely different way of life where it's not even desirable. You know, it's like there's a difference between training martial arts, even fairly obsessively, and being, uh, you know, the, the guy at the stadium who's just looking for, you know, classic thing of like European soccer stadiums where the hardcore fans are using the games as an excuse to have these giant gang fights, right? That's a little different, you know, not quite. Yeah. They both deal with violence. They both deal with conflict. In my way of seeing things, it's a lot healthier than the alternative. Yeah, I, I, that's fascinating. I've, I've thought about that before where, with soccer, it's so bizarre that it has to be one of the most, I don't know, least, least violent sports where they, they, you know, fake injuries. Mm -hmm. They just oh. fake, that's part of the, part of the sport is just getting a, someone brushing past you and pretending it was a catastrophic injury, which yep. we know is not true. And yet they have the most violent fan base imaginable. Yeah. How does that how does that make sense? I've never been able to wrap my head around that. Yeah, I mean that I think that speaks volume about a lot of modern society, like people loss of identity, people loss of uh, being part of a group, people desperately want to belong to something. And you know, all belonging is built on a we versus them mentality. And what's more dramatic of a we versus them than just you know, we have our colors, we have our flags, they have their flags, we clash with, again, it goes back to something that just was there from the dawn of humankind, you know, it's something mm. that we understand very well, it's our tribe versus theirs. We don't live in tribe anymore, but the need is still there, that need to identify with that small group, and, and it's funny, yeah, you people show up, where does it show up? Or in soccer fans? No sense, you know? Yeah, so it's... It it's interesting what you say then about the, the tribal conflict because I, I, under, I understand that. And even within the, the martial arts, I do think that exists still with, or, or it did, probably does still just within the different styles of training of, of martial arts. Um, especially, you know, the last 10 or 20 years now, I guess the overhaul with mixed martial arts being developed. Um, and there's still, you know, the traditional martial arts schools going going around and i guess the the broad categorization you could make is you know the mixed martial arts is more real but at the well but at the same time you know there's all those barbaric elements that people get turned off from in yeah. you know cage fighting you know that that turn people away from yeah. martial arts so you know even though that's got that that benefit to it could we not go back to just, you know, training the traditional martial arts. We don't get injured. Everyone's, you know, everyone's, ha everyone's happy and we're getting a workout in. And can we not just get the same benefits from, from doing that? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely advantages to some of that stuff. You know, it's like when my daughter, my daughter is 10 years old now and, you know, she started martial arts a little bit ago, like I think when she was seven or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are like, oh, are you going to put her in jujitsu? And I'm like, no, I think I'm just going to put her in taekwondo at first. Yeah. Because for it especially, it's so much simpler to follow. There's the structure. These guys are pros at like their teaching methodology. They know exactly how to handle kids. They know how to teach them some basic body dynamics that they're going to be able to take to a bunch of other things that they're going to do in life. And they do it. Like my daughter was like, she really doesn't like authority very much. Like at school when there's like mm. calls for the principal says this, that this. My daughter kind of always has a roller ice reaction of like, fuck this, I want to deal with this stuff. But when it came in, like she loved it. She had no problem with it. And I was like, how the hell is that possible? You know, it's like, this is super regimented and they are so, but it's like, yeah, but I trust them. You know, there's something about these guys, the way they teach that I accept the discipline and authority from them because they, they do it well. I don't mm. accept it from those guys because they are not credible to me. But these, these guys over here, they, and I think, you know, I was there. Usually that's not my style at all. You know, the kind of mm. Korean regimented approach is far from my approach. 
But when I was watching the classes, I was like, these guys are really good at it. And, you know, it's not going to work for everybody. You know, the next person is going to have the same setup and they are terrible and they just spend their time yelling at kids and it doesn't, you know, it's not yeah. a good idea. But some, when it's done well, there's something good about that approach. When it's a little more structure, when it's a little more, there's more emphasis on some values that we like, especially for kids, but even for adults. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. I actually did a bit of taekwondo myself a couple of years ago. Got the got the yellow belt, but then then, then stopped. And um, like one thing I noticed is, yeah, they like they've been doing it a long time. They run a good class. It's you know, it's, there was you know, it was it was fine. It was good fun. But yeah, with that with that authority, and I especially think that it's good for kids as well. What you're saying, yeah. it's you know, it's it's perfect for perfect for kids. You can always do jujitsu later. You know, it's, yeah. that's great, but not right now. Early on, yeah. I thought it was perfect to go with the traditional one. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. But so then, how do you think that you know people can get that authority and and do it right in martial arts when that's so open to, um, let's say, people ab- abusing that that authority as well it's something yeah. that we see you know that's almost an archetype in martial arts of just the the dictator who you know smashing people over the back with kendo sticks or something and just you know ab- abusing that authority how do how do we get that mix right of proper respectful authority and just not and just this complete yeah. uh, dis- disabandonment of it i mean i think unfortunately boils down to um to individuals Mm Because, you know, we can uh, put together all the right elements that would be ideal. And in the hands of one person, they turn out perfect. In the hands of the next person, that's why even martial arts, you know, we all have this idea of the martial art teachers as these guys who don't just teach you martial arts, but they have something about life they can teach and so on. Most don't. Most martial Mm -hmm. art teachers are really good at what they do, maybe, hopefully. And they don't necessarily have any deep wisdom to pass on anything else other than how to mm-hmm. apply a good armbar, you know, that's it. And, and so you see in so many cases, as you say, abuse of authority by martial art teachers, both on every level, from like sexual abuse, that unfortunately there's a whole lot of that stuff that you see going on, mm-hmm. to just psychological abuse of their students, to just manipulate, you know, there's a lot of terrible people that really shouldn't be teaching who, because they happen to be good athletes and they have good technical knowledge, they are teachers. Unfortunately, mm. that's the same thing in anything else. You know, if you go to school, uh, one teacher is going to be awesome and the next teacher is terrible and you're wasting your time. You know, they shouldn't have that authority. Unfortunately, it's very hard to, it's really trial and error on the part of the customer to figure out, to separate one from the next, to figure out who's the real de- It's kind of the same thing as like, how do you pick your friends? How do you pick the people you date? It's hard. I hear that. You can check all the boxes of like what it should be, but then one person is amazing and one person turns out to be a nightmare. Unfortunately, there's no certified program to have a good date or the certified way to have a good coach. I mean, it's better to have some standards than not having them, but that doesn't guarantee that they are going to come out being great instructors. It, mm. So it's... Unfortunately, that's the way it goes. You know, you got to have your eyes open in any field of life when you're looking for a martial art teacher, when you're looking for friends, when you're looking for whatever. Whoever you bring into your life, you need to be able to recognize who's the real deal and who's not such a pleasant human being. Yeah. No, that, that, that makes sense. And I guess it's an archetype, again, of martial arts that the, the, the teacher, the master is going to impart some other form of wisdom beyond just the, the physical training. And, you know, that's, that's in the mythology. Mm-hmm. But then is that a, do you think that that's a responsibility that the, that the teacher should provide? Because, you know, I look around when I'm teaching and, you know, I'm, Hey, I'm just wearing, wearing pajamas in a silly, you know, in a silly costume. And the person in front of me might be, you know, doctors, lawyers, what, whatever, any, any master in their own profession. And if I can tell you how to choke someone, I'm, I'm not here to tell you about life. You know, that's um, what, what, what do you know? When do you think yeah. people should do that? Is there a responsibility to do it? I think what you do, and these would be true whatever you do, it doesn't just have to be martial art, but in whatever field you do where you have students, you're going to teach them a technical skill, in this case, martial arts, 
And then you're gonna, if you are, uh, you're gonna share who you are. And if who you are has some depth to you, if you are as something beside technical skill to offer, people are gonna pick up. Mm-hmm. And if not, then yeah, you really shouldn't force it. Like it's not a good idea to just say, let me just teach you guys all about life. <laughs> it happens. It's going to happen kind of indirectly just because that's who you are. That's how you speak. Those are the examples you bring to the table. That's the energy that you bring to the table. That's the, you know, not because you have a title or because you have, uh, everybody should listen to me because I'm the master. It's more like if you are, if people gravitate to you because they like what you have to say, it's because of your charisma. It's because maybe they listen to something you said and it, it really rang through to them and they applied it in their life and it worked. Mm. and it made their life better but you don't do it because you sit down and think like let me how i'm going to teach you the wisdom of life you do it Mm. because you just share who you are and if who you are can deliver that to people then that's great and you should you know it it is important to like in anything you do you should try to help the people you come in contact with and especially if you have students the goal is to teach them a skill but also to help them in life if you are able to Hmm. But without that arrogance of, oh, because I got a black belt somehow, I'm a master of life. No, you are who you are. And again, maybe you have some wise things to pass on, maybe you don't. Hmm. I think a lot of it is role play. People take it too seriously and they think that now I'm supposed to embody this ideal. And it's like, no, now you're supposed to be you teaching a skill. If you happens to be somebody who's wise, who can share things that will help people life, that's great. And you definitely shouldn't repress that. Let it flow as part of the teaching. But it's going to come up naturally, not because of a role that you embody. Mm, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's very, very important. So just focus on those, on those skills, just giving the, the ability to impart the knowledge of the skills in the best possible way. And just if anything else flow fl- comes from that, people get drawn to whatever it else they can take something from that. Then l- let it let that be what it be what it is. But totally, and it can be done humbly. You know, it can be done where it's like, hey guys, you know, this is something that for me has translated from the maths to the rest of life. Mm-hmm. This is something that in my life it helped. Take it as you will. It works for you, great. I'm glad if you can pick it up. You already know it. Good for you. You don't think it applies to you? Who cares? That's fine. You know, it's like you just share something that is part of your experience, which is what all of us ultimately can do. It's like, hey, this happens to be something that uh, for me, it really helped me. So it's not exactly the, you know, fortune cookie inspirational quote. It's more like this idea really worked for me. But again, I'm not trying to convert you to anything. It's like, Mm. now I'm done. I shared it. Now it's up to you to decide whether you want to do something with it or not. That's right. I think one of the best things about the, the new, you know, mixed martial arts is the, is how it allows that, that testing. Because what I, what I, what I found with, uh, like, especially Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the reason, one of the reasons I keep doing it is just the, the, the unique thing of, you know, solving difficult problems under stress that mm-hmm. is just, you know, it's simple. I don't like to attach anything else to it just of, you know, no mystical, mystical side. It's just we solve problems under stress and that can be used in any field or profession that you're in. You know, that's, that's it. That's one of those, one of those things. And I think as a teacher, that may be a good thing to shine a spotlight on, right? It's like, hey man, you're doing a phenomenal job after years of training. Uh, you know, you can tell your student, hey, you see how, what a great job you're doing under stress and coming up with solutions. Uh, can you do it in the rest of your life? Mm. What stops you from like, why is it that when your kids are acting up, suddenly all your wisdom go out the door and you're not able to? Why? What do you think would help? Is there a way that you can make a translation from that ability that you have when we talk about jujitsu? Can you bring that to something else? And you know, you can toss ideas back and forth and figure out what are the obstacles that people struggle with, what is if it makes sense to you. Because you know, we, we all... Nobody's great at everything. You know, mm. you can take uh, all the, take all the, not just the technical skill, but even the mental skills that go with somebody like Michael Jordan. Is he able to apply them in the rest of his life? 
I mean, if he could do that in every aspect of his life, he would be like the Buddha, right? He would be <laughs> going through it all. And he's like, probably not. Yeah. He has that ability. Yeah. So it's easier when you have that ability in one field to then make the jump to other fields. It's not automatic at all. And it's not easy, but it's easier. You know, it's like, and I think that's part of something that we should put attention on sometimes. It's like, okay, we, you're learning these things, what for? Just mm-hmm. because you want to win the next tournament or just so that you can have an hour of mental health when you do jujitsu. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. Can we take it a step further too? Can we take that idea and just run with it even a little bit more? Can you, how does it work in there? And, you know, and, and again, it's not done in a, I'm the wise master, let me teach you the ways. It can be more through dialogue, it can be more through just throwing hints and that people can decide to run with or not, you know? Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So yeah. just instead of like, you know, because I, I would never tell someone how to fix a problem in their, in their personal life unless they, you know, ask specifically or something for my opinion. I just like, no, that's, I don't want to give this unsolicited, here's how you should do something. Unless, you know, if you don't ask, you probably don't want to hear it from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think a good thing there is just sharing one's experience. Because, you know, one's experience is usually not perfect. There are, there are situations where you mess up. There are situations where you are frustrated, where it's like, man, I should know better. I, how can I apply it in this context and not in this other one? And then, but, you know, not in the classic, let me tell you how I was lost and then I was found kind of thing. You know, you're not, again, you're not setting yourself up to be this, uh, you're, you're just sharing life. You know, you're just sharing things that work, things that didn't, things that ideas, and then you let people take what they will from it. Mm. Oh, that, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Just, just, you know, sharing those experiences and I guess, the probably the most important part then is just focusing on the skill and being good at the the best you can at the, at the skill that you do and i guess the better you get at the skill hey maybe maybe the more chance there is of people being able to pick up or learning other things from it and probably yourself being able to learn other things from it well i mean if you're going to become a good teacher of a skill that means you're not going you're going to have to be a good communicator mm. To be a good communicator, you're doing more than passing a skill because that means you know how to read people because no two people have the same learning style. So that means that when you are working with somebody, you are able to tailor your teaching of that particular skill in a way with that tone that that person will respond to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you do that, if you learn how to do that, you're learning something about life. And then you can also help somebody out in ways that are, again, more indirect, but because you have that ability. Because, again, a teacher is not just somebody who can perform a skill in an amazing way. doesn't necessarily make a good teacher. You know? mm. It's like I've had, uh, I've had experiences sometimes where, I mean, I know I can teach well things that I'm good at. But I've had very funny, like, for example, my jiu-jitsu is pretty good. My judo kind of sucks, right? It's like, mm-hmm. hey, it's okay at best. It's not that great. But I've had days when I work with people on some judo stuff and they are like, man, I learned more judo now than in the last six months. And I'm like, how is that possible? Because my judo really sucks. You know, mm-hmm. I'm barely hanging myself. How is it possible that you're... <laughs> but then I realize and I'm like, oh, because I see these like four guys in front of me who are way better than I am. But their communication is not the greatest. So it's kind of one of those that if you learn by watching, well, watch those guys because they can pour, for, perform it in a way that's so much better than I could ever could. Mm. But if you learn in other ways, um, maybe then that's a different skill. That's not just the skill of being able to execute the move perfectly. There are other communication skills involved that somebody may respond to better. Sometimes we think, you know, even in school, they don't teach you how to, you know, you go to school, you get a master, you get a PhD. That doesn't mean in any way that you're a good communicator. Mm-hmm. That just means that you know how to jump through the hoops, to do the research or to do the whatever stuff. To, but that is it's a completely different field from actually having that knowledge and being able to communicate it to other human beings. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we think that it's one and the same. It's not. You know, unless you work on communication, unless you work on yourself that way, that's not going to come through just because you know the technical skills. 
Mm. They are related, but you know, you cannot have, if your technical skill sucks, no matter what a good communicator you are, it's never going to, you're not going to do a good job. Yep. So you need to have a technical skill. But by itself, the technical skill is not going to do it. You also need something beyond that, and that, that communication style. Yeah, no, that that's it's funny. It, rem- it reminds me of um, at university. There was one day they had a lecture on on how important it is to engage a classroom and keep keep everyone's attention. And the way they did that was the lady was reading bullet points off a PowerPoint about the importance yeah. of keeping <laughs> of keeping everyone engaged. And I'm sitting here going, "Is anyone else? What is going? What is going on here?" Yeah, it's totally like that, right? I mean, I look at uh, like sometimes when I talk with I don't know if you listen to Dan Carlin who does hardcore history podcast. He's an absolute genius in terms of communicating history. He has a BA in history. That's it. You know, there are like three gazillion people on earth who are more advanced degrees who have done that more. That's why he's all like, I'm not really a historian, but he's like, well, you're more of a historian than most, like you're able to communicate history so much better than three zillion of these guys with their fancy titles. Yeah. And that's like part of that, I think has to, you know, has to be the way you can tell a story of whatever information you're trying to get across and like weave it into some kind of, you know, of narrative just to be able to get, get people's attention, you know, get people's attention into it and somehow get, just make it interesting to just finding out what, what that is. But I find it so hard to, you know, just figure out how you can do that with, with a dense piece of information or, or a wrist lock or something, you know, there's that, how do you bring bring that stuff to life? Do you do you have any any ideas? I mean, I think it's there are a lot of ways. None of them are it. You know, there are no the seven steps to become yeah. a great community. It's not that easy. But I think there are a bunch of things you can do. It's like you, reading books. I think mm-hmm. reading helps a lot because it develops your mind in certain direction. It's kind of like the Game of Thrones thing, right? Where there's a uh, Tyrion Lannister who's like, look at me. What am I going to do? I, I'm not a warrior. I'm not the, but I, I sharpen my mind through reading books. That's the skill I develop. Reading books is huge. Yeah. Um, paying attention to people, engaging with people, like communicate, like making a skill of that, of reading people, of seeing how people respond, seeing, you know, if you use a certain tone, it works with this person, but this person really doesn't respond to it. Mm. You know, there are so many times that I see cases where, I see person A communicating and I totally get where they are coming from, right? And there's nothing wrong with what they are saying. But the, la- the body language, the tone, the humor they are using is clearly not made to be received by person B. Yeah. Person A is like, what's wrong with person B? Why can't they get it? I'm being nice. And person B is like, this person is a jerk. And it's like, you're both right. It says <laughs> that they are speaking different languages and nobody's understanding that you need to switch the language if you want to be understood by person B. You cannot communicate with person B the same way you did with person C. Yeah. It's a whole different game. And, and, and that requires paying attention, you know, yeah. among other things. There are a bunch of things that are going to do it, but definitely paying attention is huge. Yeah, that, that, that paying attention to, I, yeah, I, can't, I find it hard to quantify that, but it's, it, I know exactly what it means. It's just you have to just be paying attention and then just go from that. And then you can go from instincts. It's yep. like pay attention to the data coming in, the scientific, okay, and then just let that guide the instincts for however you're going to react somehow, how, however, <laughs> however that can work. Well, because, I mean, that's really a tricky thing. It's, it's yeah. kind of like another of the skills that are human skills. It's sort of like saying, you know, once we agree that, for example, using humor usually helps people relax and uh, pay more attention eventually because they're having fun and all of that. Well, that's great. But if you're not a funny person by nature, that doesn't help you, right? It's yeah. like, you should be funny. It's like, thanks, I'm not. <laughs> you know, yeah. works when somebody who is not funny tries to be fun. It's like, okay, forget it. Don't forget you were, that was a bad idea. You know? Yeah. So it's hard because we all expect that there's this clear blueprint to acquire certain things. That granted, there, there, is a blue, there are certain things that are more likely to deliver good results than others, but they are far from guarantees. You know, there's not, and some of it, unfortunately, is, uh, 
is not very democratic, but that's the reality of it, that not everybody has the same talent for all the same things. Mm. You know, some people are going to pick, you know, I can work like a dog at a skill and I'm never going to be as good as somebody else who has a natural talent for it and work on it on top of it. You can just improve and try to get better at it, but not, you're not going to create a skill out of thin air. Mm. Just, yeah, just trying to improve and, and keep pushing that boundary forward. And then eventually that'll just, I guess, be able to, you, you'll be communicating better, getting that engagement, getting that attention, and also then communicating the skill better and maybe imparting some kind of other, other lessons that, that people can take away. Yeah, because, I mean, what we're talking about is not just about martial arts and it's not even just about teaching. It's about becoming just a good human being. That's huge. That's huge. <laughs> it's not a simple answer. It's That's like, not simple at all. She was that easy. Okay, step one, do this. Yeah. Step, do this. step three, boom, done. You're a great human. Oh yeah, I wish it was that easy. Although, I mean, I, I guess that's you know people have tried through th- throughout history of writing down different ways that could that can be done. But you know, maybe the way we're we're going now is mixing that that reading of books and taking that intellectual pursuit to to you know gain that knowledge, gain that confidence, gain that that you know that broadening of your of ideas, and then mixing it with cage fighting. <laughs> Totally. I'm a big fan of a yin yang approach to life, right? You need mm-hmm. different things. Even that's a length. Like, if all you do is read books, yeah. they're going to be really good at communicating who are with people who are kind of nerdy. Mm. Uh, they're not going to necessarily how to communicate, even if you have the intellectual understanding of what somebody who comes from a completely different background is like. You don't have the life experience, you don't have that energy attached to you. So, it's not going to work. Mm. You know, it's like I remember I had students in, um, you know, I teach in college. So I had students in my college classes who then would want to come train with me. And so we're hanging out, we're training. And, you know, suddenly they develop a whole different attitude toward me. Because maybe some of these guys come from straight up from the ghetto, right? Where it's like, look, I like the stuff you say in the classroom. Um, it's cool. It's interesting. But none of that stuff translates to my experience in the ghetto. You know, it's like when, you, when I can punch you in the head and you just laugh it off, smile, take me down and choke me out, that speaks a language that I understand very well from where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> and so having more than one language that way that you can adapt is something that now that same person can listen to me blab a lot intellectually and be 10 times more interested because I gain credibility in their eyes, because I excel at something that makes sense in their world, mm-hmm. right? Similarly, if all you do is, um, it goes the other way around, right? It goes both ways. So it's like with most of life is made of different energies and you want to try, if not to master, at least to be decent at as many of them as possible. You know, you want to be comfortable if you're talking with like some professor in a Ivy League university and if you are sitting in a room full of gangsters, you want to feel just as comfortable, right? Because you can switch the language easily from one to the other. You can relate to one and you can relate to the other. And a lot of that is life experience, right? Mm. A lot of that is uh, just being open to not just stick to one thing in your whole life. Like I hate it when, as much as I love martial arts, I can't stand where all the people I know in martial arts, all they can talk about is martial arts. Yeah. Like, Man, do you not get bored? It's like, I love it. I get it. I can nerd out with you forever, but there's a little more to life. You know, it's like, yeah. can we talk about something else? Can we? Yeah. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we turn our passion into an obsession where that, that's the one and only lens through which to see life. Like, no, that's one lens. It's a lens I like. It's cool. I dig it. But there's so many other. Experience a whole bunch of them. Mm-hmm. And that way you are at least conversational in these other languages. If not, you know, you're, of course, time is what it is. There are 24 hours in a day. You can't master everything. You know, you're going to pick a few things they are going to focus on. But be at least decent at the many things. Mm. No, I, I, I agree. That's, you know, probably what I'm at least trying to trying to do myself. Um, and, but the, the one thing I, I sometimes think about that is the old, old saying, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. 
it's like, ah, oh, my, I'm, you know, splitting myself too thin. Should I, you know, what gives me the right to, to, am I ever going to gain any kind of authority in one realm if I don't focus all my attention into that? And, you know, how can that crossover be a benefit? I think there's a point where it's diminishing returns, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you're trying to be the best in the world at one thing, yes, you probably need to dedicate 10 hours a day at that. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that you can become really good in a much smaller amount of time. You know, let's say that you dedicate 50% of the time that somebody who's obsessed with an activity dedicated. You're going to be really amazing at that. Mm-hmm. Now, every 10% more that you dedicate, you're going to gain millimeters you know it's like if you if it's a game where you are competing with the best of the best the millimeter makes all the difference but if you just want to do it for life enrichment then being uh, even as a teacher let's say you do teach martial arts Mm. and you gain enough ability to be you know you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu you're a black belt in whatever it is you know you have that technical skill it takes time it takes energy but there's a point where if all you do is keep going down that path because i want to be the greatest black belt there is it's like yeah, now you're losing a ton of time that could be put in other fields so that you could be good at six things, really good at two, and maybe you're not a, the number one person in the world or any of them. Mm. You're an extremely complete human being. You know, you have a lot to your personality. You have a lot, like people who know you for that one thing suddenly discover this other side of you and are like, wow. That's so, that's so much more interesting if it, all there is to you is you are the god of that one particular field. Yeah. You know, it's like if you want, uh, again, it works in sports when you want to be the absolute best and that's your goal. Okay, that's a different story. Uh, it's probably a good idea if you're going to get heart surgery. Like, I don't care if you are, my heart surgeon is a poet, like I want to. <laughs> You know, it's like I wanted to do it in their sleep, right? That's what. But other than those things, most of life, you can get really good at something, but then there's a point where for their time invested into that skill, what you gain is so small mm. that that same amount of time could have been spent elsewhere and you would have gotten to a level where you are decent at it or pretty good at it. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with that and I've, I've thought about that. A few times for the, for the idea that, yeah, if like, if you're an Olympic athlete, you're going for the gold medal, you have to do things to achieve that goal that are going to be detrimental to your health yeah. in, you know, in other, in long-term health, detrimental to other parts of your life. You know, there's going to be a lot of negative side effects to achieve that gold medal. And that's okay. just the way it is. And if you yeah. decide to make that your goal, you have to take that responsibility on. And the competition for that too. It's there's no guarantees that that's ever gonna. There's no guarantees that's ever gonna yeah. gonna happen. One day and your entire career trajectory is gone. One one day you have a yeah. eat a eat a bad breakfast that morning and maybe that throws it all off. It's yeah. It's a big risk and I salute those people who take it. But if if you are trying to you know mix a few different skill pursuits together and get it a good level for all of those you can actually find i guess yourself in a situation that you've created a unique skill set or unique Mm -hmm. combination of things that maybe you you know you could be the best at that maybe maybe not or just you know some level of a of a unique you know skill set and depth about you absolutely and i think that's what makes you you right Mm. you are able to do this uh four, five, six, whatever many things fairly well in a way that allows you to become a more complete human being, which mm-hmm. for the point of view of just mental and physical health and relating to other people is way more valuable than becoming the, the one guy in that field. The one guy, the specialist is usually not the most fun human being to be around because all they can talk about is that one thing. All they know about is that one thing. They it doesn't translate to a life skill. It translates to just that one field. And it's like, I don't know. I feel like there's so much more to life to it mm-hmm. that it's, um, it's kind of what you were saying about the Olympic athletes. You know, it's really become detrimental to your overall well-being. Mm. And like, yeah, with, like with that detrimental thing to our, to our well-being, if we're taking the, 
pursuit of being that number one. Like, what, what do you think is it with, you know, the martial arts, particularly the modern martial arts? Like, we, we go into it knowing that, well, maybe not even going into it, but eventually everyone's going to experience some kind of injury. Sure. Pro- probably, probably. But people could get lucky and, you know, it's, it's maybe the role of the teacher to minimize the risk of injury, but, you know, that's, that's going to happen. There's going to be that detrimental side effects. And then, is you know can we not just take a more you know softer softer approach and you know or like does that just lead itself to falling over when we come up to against any real test of of the abilities well and i think that's where there's a line right it's a balance you know it's sort of if uh, you know if you spar hard all the time you're gonna get brain damage Mm. Yeah, you are too easy all the time. It's completely not realistic. And the first time you take a real punch, you are completely shocked and can't handle it. Yeah, you want to find probably are, are on the side of safety. You know, you want more on the soft than the hard, but you need to have a little bit of the hard experience in a controlled fashion, just something that give you that edge. Mm. And I think that's uh, that's the important thing. Is fine, and that balance is not the same for everybody. You know, yeah. if you are 18 years old and you heal from injuries really fast, you can push a little harder. If you are some 50-year-old guy, you have to tailor that balance in a different direction. So it's, we all do it because everybody's body is fragile to one degree or another. But that exact spot changes in life, changes from one person to the next. And, uh, and it's kind of like, I know a lot of people, for example, like I'm, I'm 46 now. And, you know, generally speaking, the people who are good at judo, they do it from when they are kids. Mm. Because you take so much damage getting thrown that nobody wants to learn judo in their 40s. You know, yeah. and you, you're already good by that point. But again, and yeah, you're not going to ever become the best at it. You're not going to win the Olympics. You're not going to do any of that. But like so many will never train because it's taught in a way that's just too hard. That like it's built to teach 15-year-old kids, not to teach people who are adults who start when they are in their 30s or 40s or 50s. Like, not gonna... But can you teach it in a way where these people will still learn something valuable? Yeah, you can. You can switch it around. Rather than doing hard randori all the time where people slam each other, you can do more of a playful randori where you're doing a lot of entries. You know, you like if I unbalance you and I set you up for the sweep and you are right there and I'm kind of holding, I don't even need to take you down at that point. It's like both you and I know that I had it, that he was there. Now, once in a while, we go a little harder and we'll do go for the full takedown. But a bunch of times, you know, rather than having to get thrown uh, 300 times a night, you get thrown five times a night. Mm. And suddenly you learn a lot of skills that, sure, the guy who's getting thrown 300 times and going at that level of intensity probably learns more stuff if they don't break down. (laughs) Probably it's like, great, that was realistic and you learned all this stuff. But now like... Three years later, you can no longer practice. So who's going to get better? The guy who practice a little more mellow for the next 20 years or the guy who push hard and destroy their body? I know what you mean. And I think that's a good point for talking about how to keep people engaged, you know, knowing what would be the best way to tailor training of martial arts to the different you know, body types and ages and whatever their goals will be. That's probably the the most important thing about being able to keep someone engaged and learn whatever it is you're trying to impart is by making sure they keep showing up on the mats and don't just decide to quit. Totally, because that's that's huge, right? It's like I realize, you know, I'm I'm not gonna be able to do certain things and that's okay. But mm. I can still get decent, I can still learn some stuff, I can have fun, I can why not? That's a good goal. I'm done with that. Again, it's not the Olympic athlete goal, but it's a goal that works for my life, that yeah. makes me happy, that adds elements to my life. If the only choices are train like a madman or don't train at all, those are not great choices. You yep. know? The, the person who can afford to train like a madman, they are few and far between, and more likely than not, they are not going to be able to do it for their entire life. Yeah, I, I agree with that. and It makes me think about... Uh, like the role then of competition, because I know there's a, um, a saying or something along the lines of, you know, once in your life, you should train, you know, as if your life depended on it or as hard as you ever trained before. It's, I kind of get where that's coming from. I kind of feel like everyone, 
you know, hey, it's, you should compete at least once in, you know, in jujitsu, which has a relatively low risk of injury. Sure. But I understand it's, it's not for everyone too. And, you know, hey, if you, you know, your job involves you, if an injury happened and you lost your job and everything would be thrown into chaos, I get it. You know, you know, you train very differently and that's fine. Again, it's not a bad thing. It's, there are limits to what you mm. can do and that's okay. What do you think could, they could be missing out? By never competing or what's that extra benefit of of pushing yourself that one time to get into getting to a competition that can you learn that elsewhere or can that only be learned in that in competition I mean, some of the stuff of competition it's hard to replicate in other mm. companies you know the reality is that people are going to go way harder in a way that when you have never experienced it it's very hard to uh, to even imagine you know the first time people compete is like first they don't know what it's like to be under the level of pressure you know they may be gods in the gym but now suddenly they feel they wake up in the morning and their heart is racing and it's hard to breathe and their muscles are sensing up and they're like what why what's going on i've never you know in experience that mental state of it the fear the, the stuff that you're not going to experience when you're on the mat with your friend um, rolling easy you know that just not gonna, in some way it's fun not to experience those things because it's not a great state to be like for the next three days i'm just gonna be immersed in fear and anxiety it's like yeah I, let me sign up for that that sounds so fun <laughs> Terrible, right yeah and so no you don't want to do that all the time but as an experience it's something that maybe it allows you to learn how to deal with fear and anxiety a little bit better maybe you know, often it does. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't. Sometimes you reinforce the fear and anxiety because you are afraid, you're anxious, you go out there, you get squashed, you are even more traumatized about it. You never yeah. want to do it again. It's worse than if you never did it, right? It would have been better for you not to do it at all. But, you know, ideal, you do it with enough wisdom of where you compete, who you compete against, all of that, that you learn that you get that experience, but in a way that allows you to thrive. Now, maybe you don't win, but you still feel good about it. You know, yeah. you feel, okay, I, I dealt with it. I felt that anxiety and I was able to step up and perform at my best. That's pretty much what I experience uh, every time I enter a competition. And like, I, I enjoy competition myself and, you know, I try and enter in as much as I can. I, I understand that's just me, but man, enter in and it's fine. But like, uh, you know, the morning of competition, I'm always like, Why? Why did I do this? I could be out somewhere on a, you know, it's a nice sunny day outside. I could be doing anything else at the beach, going to see a movie, kicking back, having a good time. Instead, I'm driving to a, to a gym in, you know, the middle of somewhere where some guy is going to try and, you know, break my arm and sweat all over me. And, and it's going to be really uncomfortable. Yeah. What on earth am I thinking? But then always when it's done, win, lose or draw, whatever happens, I'm like, ah, it's this, a sense of relief and I'm glad I did that. That was fun. I'm, that was enjoyable. It was it was a good experience. And I, I still, after all these years, I don't know why that is, <laughs> how, how that yeah. happens, why I keep doing it. I don't know. What do you think, what is that you like about the competition then? You know, if you do feel that stuff, you do feel that like, oh, this sucks, this is, what is that makes you want to do it? I, yeah, I, I, I really don't know because it's, it's that something. Cause I don't, you know, probably if I didn't get that fear, I don't think I'd like it as much. It is that it's something that relief afterwards of, ah, oh, it wasn't so, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> I, like, that, ah, oh, that was, that was good. That was fun. It wasn't, maybe it's like, Probably like anyone, I can have negative thoughts about what's going to happen in the, in the world. And I'm, and I can get in trapped into ways of thinking about, Oh, this is going to go wrong in my life. And this is going to go bad in my life. And something's going to come and hit me one day and everything's going to turn to chaos. And you know, I get, I, you get trapped in those, in those thought patterns and start <laughs> even thinking about it. I can start thinking of examples that I can go back to and. Yeah. The, the, and when I enter in those competitions, I guess some of that, there's a, 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 a tangible example of, okay, I'm having bad thoughts about things that could happen on this specific day at this specific time in this specific match. Are these thoughts real? Like, right. 
Last time, last competition I had, I was coming back from injury. I had meniscus surgery on my on my knee in, at the start of the year, and I really wanted to compete by the end of the year just to right. to say like I overcame that that yeah. injury. But the morning of, I was like, "What am I thinking? I oh, was like, I haven't given it enough time. I'm gonna re-injure this knee for sure." Let mm-hmm. me just tape it up as much as I can because, oh, for sh- um, by the time I got to the venue, I was thinking, I'm for sure there's no way I'm getting out of this injury without re injuring my knee. Right. I just had all the negative thoughts were filled, of were, filled, were filled in me. And then, so that's my prediction of the world, I guess. My prediction is I'm going here today and I'm going to stuff up my knee again. Oh, well, can't change anything about that too late. Of course, I go, I go in the match. You know, that didn't didn't go my way, but you know, the the knee was fine. I was right. I was wrong. The great <laughs> those right. negative thoughts weren't re- those negative okay. thoughts weren't real. What a what a relief! Every you know every negative thought I have isn't isn't going to come true. Brilliant. Thanks so yes. much. And that gives me a kind of I don't know. I just I just a oh, that's that's the motivation to know. Hey, okay, there's there's okay the good things will come true sometimes too and not all the negatives will come true let's let's go with that yeah there's something about dealing with fear that people who never ever have to deal with fear or unpleasant things the day when those things show up in their life they are completely unprepared for them Mm. if you have had at least a little bit of a sort of ritualized experience like a martial art competition it certainly helped Mm. it helped to uh to deal with that because otherwise it's a crushing thing. You know, fear is a horrendous emotion. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's something that that's, I, I kind of think this, a hard thing is, is then balancing that fear because it's, I, I know it's, it's popular just to be, you know, we only need positive thinking about that, you know, banish, banish all fear. Well, good luck. You can want to banish it all you want, but it's going to show up, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> The other guy across the cage wants to take your head off. You can have both positive all you want, but when you, it's like, oh, damn, it's real. That's, this is not just about what I think. This is about these people who's coming to kill me. Yeah. So, and that's, so. I, I've, I remember one time I even did that with training where I was thinking, you know what? It's, it's just my mindset that's that right. why I'm getting smashed in this role against this person. I, yeah. it, was, it was just in my head. If I go in there and I just think confident thoughts and just, I know I'm beating this guy today. There's right. nothing going to change it. Then I'll, that's, that's the thing. And then, and then pff, the same thing happened. Of course, the, th- yeah. <laughs> the thoughts, well, maybe they helped a bit. And- yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Better than, you know, because again, those things are not wrong, but there's, inches right it's like you can improve your game a few inches it's not gonna turn uh, you know just because i think positive i'm not gonna go be the best in the world tomorrow at anything you know it just yeah not gonna be- it's yeah it's, 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 it's very interesting it's like it's important to develop those aspects without becoming dogmatic about it where you think that that's the solution to everything because it won't be yeah and that's i that's where I, I like i know the danger is you don't want to have that delusional confidence yeah. that's not based on anything and exactly. at least with the martial arts i can get that that test i can yeah. get that okay yeah. Am I, is my confidence warranted well, yes exactly or no right. i know you know exa- exactly it's a firm gauge of my positive and negative thoughts the confidence yeah. and fear where where what's my ability to judge this accurately let's let's go have a look absolutely that's exactly how it is and it's funny how we forget how much of that game is mental because Mm -hmm. martial art is about fear you know it's different if you want some other sport you know you have the fear there's performance anxiety for sure you can have performance anxiety about anything but you know it's kind of like when people are afraid to give a public speech Mm -hmm. it's like it's you making sound with your mouth yeah, I understand there's fear that can come from self-esteem, from how our people are going to judge you, but objectively, there's nothing to be afraid of. You yeah. know, it's, uh, in martial art, objectively, there is something to be afraid of. <laughs> 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 it's not just me doing my thing. It's this person is going to try to slam me, and they've trained the last million years to become more effective and destroy me. I can see how that would make anxiety in those things, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's it's funny that yeah there's there's without a doubt you 
you got something to worry about. <laughs> yeah. There, many, uh, and I've seen it, you know, sometimes what's funny is that the same person who can be amazing on one day can drown the next mm. man. You know, and it's like they can be mentally perfect in one occasion and in the next one they are just not there. And it's so weird to see because it's like, wait, you did it perfectly the last time. What changed this time? And there are so many little factors that can make you or break you mentally. Mm-hmm. That nobody's just mentally invincible and nobody's mentally such crap that they are going to fail every time. You know, everybody has some, there's a possibility for everybody to rise above and to sink below. Mm-hmm. Um, Clearly, you know, the better you get at it and the more you have done it, the more the odds are you're going to stay in a certain range. But there's ultimately each day is different. Mm, that's, yeah, there's that that reaching of, of potential that I guess that, you know, taking it back to the beginning, that's probably one of the archetypes of, that's one of the mythological things, right? Of, of martial arts over mm-hmm. anything else is that, you could poten- you could potentially reach your potential with this. <laughs> yeah. And on, on a good day, <laughs> next day maybe not so much. <laughs> and that's the that that firm line in the sand. Yeah, I, that's that's important. That's you can't yeah. get that through ev- through it, through everything for sure. You know, but you're definitely going to get it with this. I think if I remember correctly, it was Greg Jackson who said it, who said that, uh, you know, everybody can be broken. Mm. Uh, The point of training is to bring the line at which you will be broken so far that the other person is not going to be able to push you there, likely. Mm. But it's not that that line doesn't exist anymore. You still have it, you know. If you apply enough pressure, everybody breaks. That's that's right. It's to push the line so far that we're going to be able to discover it and push you there. Mm. But yeah, it's not an invincibility. There is no such thing. Yeah, yeah, Uh, that's that's so true. And that's I think of uh, I think it's an old you know Jigoro uh, a Kano quote of like maybe you never know with quotes you read online if if the person said it or not. (laughs) But you know, I'm not trying to be better than someone else. I'm just trying to be better than yesterday. Yeah, ultimately, that's all you can do. Right? Yeah. That's the point. Is uh, all other, all you can control is yourself. Ultimately, you know, you don't control opponents. You don't control how well they are gonna perform. You don't control any of that. You can just. Go, that's why even like focusing on victory creates more anxiety. Mm. All you can focus on is just going out there and with the best job you can, putting everything on the line. Because that you do have under your control. You know, you you can control that aspect. But, you know, if I go out there and I put everything on the line and I do the best job and I fight somebody who's 100 pounds heavier than me and they are the greatest heavyweight of all time, <laughs> I'm still going to get crushed, you know. That I can control. But, again, all you control is your mental attitude and uh, what you bring to the table. That's it. Well, um, Daniele, thanks so much. This has been an, well, yeah, what a, what a great conversation that I've enjoyed, that I've enjoyed Thank having you with you. It was definitely a lot of fun. Yeah, it's um, like I said, it was been a fan of your work, and when you know I saw you comment on on something of mine, it was I was very happy. Let's just say I was like, wow. I was watching your videos, and I'm like, oh man, I love his videos. They are such great breakdowns. I dig them. Da, 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 da. They were like commented on it, and you responded, hey, I really like your book. I'm like, oh, perfect. This is a great. It works nice that way. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was very cool. I'll, say, I'll just say that. I'm very, awesome. very happy. So, uh, if if people want to get in touch with you, what's the what's the best way they can they can they can do that? Um, I think like you know we live in a world in which if the gods of Google tend to be good to you if you type stuff correctly. So, yeah. you know, my name is a lot of L's and it gets confusing on the spelling. Like Daniele with an E at the end, so it's like Daniel with an E at the end, and that Bolel is B O L E L L I. If you put that in Google, lots of things will pop up. Uh, personal websites where you can email or podcast or a bunch of other books, a bunch of other stuff. Beautiful. Daniele, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That was awesome. Cheers. And that concludes this episode of the Sunny Brown Breakdown. Please leave a review of the iTunes store and check out sunnybrown.net to links to all my social media. Thanks.